What I'd like to do is uh, open up for you um, uh, a topic of a book that I read, and so I'm going to make a disclaimer right at the beginning. Um, I'm not an expert per se, but uh, this book did challenge me in terms of how we might be uh, experiencing uh, ourselves as Catholics and as the Church as we move forward into the future. And the book is entitled uh, The Future Church, How the Trends Are Revolutionizing the Catholic Church, and it's by John Allen, who I'm sure many of you know has written extensively on both John Paul II and also Benedict XVI. He's had extensive history and experience as a correspondent at the Vatican. And as he states in the beginning of his book, uh, he, it's very much subjective in, in that he's drawing upon his experience, but that he has interviewed many people as a correspondent in the Catholic Church universally. And so from that personal asking and questioning and interviews, he has developed some of what he has presented in this book. So, why did this topic interest me? Well, first of all, I've chosen Pentecostalism because it is the uh, tenth trend that he introduces for us in this book. If you choose to read it, uh, and I hope some of you will after this talk, uh, certain trends that you would expect to be in this book are not there. And so he has developed uh, a criteria to choose and select what he thinks is going to actually impact the church the most. And one of those uh, six trends are the following, and I think it's important, is that each of these trends is global. It's universal. The second criteria that allows it to be a trend is that it has a significant impact at the grassroots, not just at the upper levels of Christianity or Catholicism, but it actually hits the reality of parish and people's lives. So these trends are doing that. The third is that official leadership is engaged. That means that the bishops and the laity, who are in roles of leadership, are engaging in various ways throughout the world each of these trends. Some, One of them is ecology, another deals with bioethics. Mm -hmm. So what he's saying is that we have people in leadership positions that are actually trying to further the dialogue and the engagement in uh, discussing these trends. The fourth one is that it has an explanatory power. Now what he means by that is that these trends become somewhat of a context. You're able <coughs> to put a number of issues into them. So the one that I've chosen with Pentecostalism has that uh, factor. It's also predictive that a trend has to have uh, the power to begin to predict that the church needs to react or respond to this particular trend. And then finally, that it's not ideological. And I think that's the beauty and the insight that we can receive from John Allen is that most of these trends are not ideological. They're not necessarily part of an internal debate within the church, even though some of them might touch upon it. So that's an important sort of background as to how he's chosen these trends. The other thing um, that's important for me is in my new role as uh, a bishop and being thrust into a very large diocese of Toronto you heard about my history in a very small town of London, Ontario, of 360,000 people. You can imagine uh, just the sheer adjustment of coming to a city of over two and a half million, the ethnically diverse gifts of this city, um, the challenge physically to live here, uh, to drive, to get around. Uh, it's, it's an amazing city. Um, and uh, I'm also in charge of all of the ethnically uh, pastoral uh, groups and parishes. So I'm, I'm there to support the priests and the laity that are working with all of the ethnic parishes in the Archdiocese. So that goes right across the whole GTA. And the other responsibility I have is the new lay movements. And that also has a, a factor uh, that I think has interested me in reading this book 
And even though lay movements is very big in the church, he dismisses it as one of the trends. And if you read one of the final chapters, the issue of women, John Paul II, lay movements, um, all of those he looked at and he said they don't qualify as trends that will affect the church globally, universally, and things like that. So that's a bit of a background as to why I chose this topic. <clears throat> Pentecostalism. I'm just going to give you a, a thumbnail sketch. took this off the website. Websites are very interesting sources of information. But I just want to sort of give you uh, a sense of Pentecostalism. And I don't uh, report these as having studied them in great depth. And all I'm just going to do is sort of gives us a context. But Pentecostalism is arguably the most important mass religious movement in the 20th century. Today, this movement is the second largest subgroup globally of Christianity. It has over 30 million American adherents and a worldwide following of 430 million. Pentecostalism had very, very uh, humble beginnings at the turn of this century. And it was a movement that was spawned, as many movements within Christianity, as a reaction and also as a response. It was a reaction to uh, the Methodist, the Presbyterian, and the Baptist uh, religions that had become what some within their adherents believed, that they had become uh, morally bankrupt. They had begun to focus on issues which were not essentially the roots of Christianity, buildings, liturgy. So this common theme that happens in Christianity and then also, uh, it was a movement to empower the poor and those who were uh, racially being discriminated in uh, the United States. So the black, uh, Chinese, many of the ethnic groups found a, a voice and an experience in Pentecostalism at the turn of the century. So it, it has these very um, sort of broad beginnings and it hasn't really been studied that much. As a matter of fact, the history of Pentecostalism is only about 30 years old. There's not a lot of history within its own movement. Most of what has been reported about Pe Pentecostalism are those who are, are looking at it from outside, from outside looking in. And that also has a certain shape to the description of a religion and a movement in Christianity. <clears throat> So, John Allen also looked at Pentecostalism. And so, uh, if I might, and then I'll just take about maybe 15, 20 minutes, I'll kind of summarize the chapter. I'll make some anecdotal comments myself, uh, as I mentioned. And then uh, we'll open it up for any question and dialogue amongst yourself, and then come back. And maybe we can have some fruits of insight. Maybe something hits you. If some of you have actually read the book, uh, you're going to be a leg up on some of you. If I haven't summarized it adequately, um, I mea culpa, mea culpa. Um, but I felt it was a, a trend that is going to impact this church, this city, and the GTA. And that's why I think it's important for me to present it and for us to discuss it. So... <clears throat> John Allen talks about Pentecostalism also in terms of statistics. And he drew them from uh, the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life Survey that was taken in 2006. And the following is quite interesting. That in 1970, 6% of the world's Christianity designated themselves as, pro as Pentecostal. That has increased now in 2010 to 20%. Walter Casper goes on to make the following comment, that if you add all of the other charismatic Christians, both from the Catholic denomination and other Christian denominations, we are probably looking at 25% of Christianity in the world 
stating that they are adherents to a Pentecostalism and a belief that would constitute themselves as Pentecostal Christians. Why has it become such a large uh, development? And that's why John Allen uh, felt that he needed to look at it this way. Someone said that it's best suited for our present global age. It's very personal. It allows people to use media and technology. It's focused on the word. All of these uh, are characteristics which, when combined with the global and technological age, he says, can allow it to uh, grow and to uh, flourish. There's a diversity of theological beliefs in Pentecostalism. It's very grassroots, very horizontal as a church. There's no magisterium. There's no leadership that would necessarily make statements as to what all Pentecostals believe. So we're dealing with what traditionally we would call a, a low church ecclesiology. But what is important is that Pentecostalism is able to deal with diversity. They're able to allow the faith of Christianity to be uh, rooted and grown in the diversity of different cultures, different languages. And so that needs to be considered in this whole discussion. What are the characteristics of Pentecostalism? Well, simply put, he summarizes them this way. There's a strong belief in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And when they first began to ask what baptism in the Spirit constituted and what was the sign of it, in the early beginnings of Pentecostalism, it was speaking in tongues. So this is a characteristic that many would adhere to and say is a sign of being baptized in the Spirit. There's also a great uh, belief in prophecy, uh, prayer, and miraculous healings. There's a literal interpretation of the Bible, which would then bring it up against much of our own society and the rise of rationalism, technology, and all of the issues that we're trying to deal with and to explain using that mode of reason, they are probably approaching it primarily from the use of faith and the literal interpretation of Scripture. <clears throat> There's a strong belief in uh, healings. Uh, um, there's a belief in the possibility of direct divine intervention. And with that then, is there any need for inter any intermediary role for anyone in a religious uh, uh, service, such as a priest or someone who is leading uh, a prayer meeting? So each person is endowed with the ability to be divinely inspired by God and to have the freedom and the ability to speak in that midst. So some of you tonight might be divinely inspired, gifted with insight, and part of our dialogue is to share those insights and what hits us. But we might not be doing it in a very ecstatic way other than drinking beer and having a glass of wine, but there is an ecstatic dimension to it. There's also a belief that Jesus will return during their earthly life. So the second coming of Christ will shape their moral beliefs, their moral conduct, and how they lead their lives. There's a belief in the rapture that God will gather all of the faithful, and so the need to make sure that each one receives the message of salvation and is able to be part of the elect, those who will receive the benefit of this belief in the salvation of Jesus Christ. And so it becomes important for them to reach out and to make sure that others are believers and adherents of the message of Christianity. Strong missionary thrust. There's also a belief in the commitment to evangelization, as I said, of sharing their faith with non-believers, agentes. There's an emphasis on Christ as the lone path to salvation. So that will come up against many within the religious spheres and spirituality, which talk about the various ways that we can be in touch with the divine. They would be inherents of Jesus Christ being the sole mediator of that uh, reality. As I mentioned, a conservative moral code on issues of homosexuality, extramarital sex, abortion, divorce, and alcohol consumption. 
<laughs> Higher than average rates of attendance at church services. So a higher level of commitment, a stronger support for religion in the public life, which will have benefits, I think, for us as Catholics in working with those of a Pentecostal dimension. And I'm sure many of us have seen this, they believe in the prosperity gospel. That if one dedicates their life to God, God will reciprocate with that commitment of blessing them. And the whole strong sense of material prosperity uh, is part of that. John Allen sees that there are differences. And what are the main differences and common ground that we have? <coughs> Pentecostalism holds historical uh, Reformation biases towards Catholicism. And I can speak from experience, I was thinking about this coming over, when I was working uh, as a seminarian, I had a job doing research in the engineering department helping a graduate student finish his doctorate. Uh, he didn't have much practical experience in the work world and so he hired me to uh, help him with his, his dissertation to make sure that it was practical and his uh, research would work. But he was a Pentecostal. We spent more time not looking at research results and, and laboratory results. We debated Christianity and Catholicism. He did not, he couldn't wrap his head around the fact of a priest, a seminarian, and we had great debates. But there was a lot of bias and a lot of historical negative um, misunderstandings of what Catholicism and Christianity is about. So that's a negative in our ability to enter sometimes into dialogue. Pentecostalisms also hold, as I mentioned, to uh, sola scriptura, as do some Protestants. And so, uh, but they are open to ongoing revelation. And so, but it's only personal. And so it's only momentary. And it isn't necessarily recorded. Um, they also see the fruits of the Spirit at work, and so where we have charismatic prayer and charismatic uh, religious expression and spirituality, there'll be common ground. The prosperity gospel uh, is in direct opposition to our uh, teaching and doctrine on the option for the poor. And so the whole question around liberation theology and Pentecostalism, mm -hmm. and this is where in uh, South America, mm -hmm. they have made great grains uh, in this whole area, is highlighting the difference between this option for the poor, as the church has pro uh, proclaimed it, and being in solidarity with the poor, and this whole other notion that if one gives their life to God, then God will bless them with prosperity. And so has the Catholic Church been preaching a message of the gospel which is not also part of Christianity. It's just a comment and an observation by John Allen. What I would say um, is the following, is that Catholics have lost and Protestants have lost to Pentecostalism in many ways. One of the things is that we have lost adherence <clears throat> to the religious traditions that we all have. Catholicism in South America has especially been hard hit. 71% of Latin Americans considered themselves Catholic in 2004. That was down from 80% in 1995. And also, there are now 12% of the African population that consider themselves Pentecostal. So again, growing. Here's a sound bite, which I found interesting. In the global north, dissatisfied Catholics secularize themselves, but in the south, they become Pentecostals. The positive side is that Catholicism is becoming more dynamic in the south, and the fact that the rise of Pentecostalism is also uh, highlighting what the Catholic Church has, the charismatic and lay movements. So there is some similarity and there is potential for dialogue in these two areas. Pentecostalism does promote a perfectionistic character to morality. It's like the interim ethics. 
It's like, well, we can be good for a short period of time knowing that Jesus is going to be coming imminently. We can all get our lives together if we only know that it's going to be for a short period of time. So this perfectionistic uh, perspective of morality and theology can be very strong. And as he points out, in South America, this has helped many women become empowered because their husbands and their spouses were irresponsible, did not provide for the family, did not have a good work ethic, and then all of a sudden they become, almost like in a 12-step program, they realize that they need conversion, they need this experience of God, and they turn their lives around. And it's actually helped families and helped the society. So the benefits, as John Allen says, are hard to uh, counter when you see that change of moral behavior. So that's an interesting, another aside there. What are the reasons for the growth of Pentecostalism? Now this one I find hard. How many are American here? Okay, well just one. Okay, well don't, don't take offense to this one. <laughs> This is, uh, this is a theory of John Allen, that uh, the American influence of the 30 million Pentecostals, that the U.S. has been financing the outreach of this spiritual neo-colonialism, that this is in the best interests of America to make sure that this type of spirituality becomes a colonializing influence in developing countries, a theory as to why it is getting so much financial support. Second one is that it is part of the American policy, even though it isn't explicitly stated, uh, that they want to promote Pentecostalism. Uh, he alludes to the fact of the recent um, uh, presidents. And I found it interesting that Barack Obama has chosen not to go to church because he thinks that his presence will be disruptive to the people who are there worshiping. That was, uh, that was an interesting comment in the Globe, that he went to church uh, at Christmas time, and this was the first time in over a year and a half that there was a public photo op for him to be seen in a religious context. Just an aside. Um, the other reason, and I think this is very true, is that there has been a lack of pastoral care on the part of Catholicism in many parts of the world. And this is also coupled with the shortage of priests, and so our predominance of seeing uh, the role of clergy being the primary role in which pastoral care is given mm -hmm. has maybe been counterproductive in countries that require a greater sense of personal support and accompaniment. And priests, when the ratio of priest to uh, laity is, is very high, then the priest doesn't get around to see everybody. And if every, everything is sort of focused in terms of pastoral care through a sacramental a dimension or reality, then does that have a, a negative effect in supporting uh, Catholics? And then they turn to Pentecostals. And I didn't quote this, and I should have, but the, the ratio of Pentecostal ministers to actual uh, members of a congregation is in the hundreds, like one to about 150. Um, the, the, the ratio of, of individual who looks after the pastoral cares of the community is a much lower ratio in Pentecostalism. So the priest shortage is contributing to that. Now he turns to the ideological wars that happen in the church. He said, well, you can make a case for uh, the liberals have uh, been guilty of promoting this defection to Pentecostalism. Uh, people feel alienated from the church because of its hierarchy, its issues around marriage and divorce and contraception, and therefore they want a much more horizontal, democratized church. And he turns the coin and he says, but you can also say the conservative case uh, has been made, is that uh, the defection to Pentecostalism is because of the rise of liberation theology. So we need to move back to a much more conservative perspective uh, in terms of our understanding of um, this uh, theology. Another factor is that uh, religion, 
and this is Harvey Cox, he quotes, uh, has had in the last number of years because of rationalism and an over-reliance uh, on the mind and reason is that we have lost the aesthetic, uh, the uh, emotional dimension of religion. And so we see that in the rise of devotions within the Catholic Church. Uh, piety is coming back. It's all of those things that was part of our whole religious tradition that in the Pentecostalism, uh, being open to the Spirit, speaking in tongues, uh, having this ecstatic experience of Christ and the Holy Spirit is a very important dimension of Christianity which we have sometimes lost sight of. Another issue is, believe it or not, is health. Poor health in some of these developing countries uh, have allowed people simply to turn to the mercy of God and to trust in God working to heal. We've just received a saint here in Canada, a miracle worker, someone who touched and healed the lives of many who were infirm. And in the 20s and 30s, health care was not what it is today. And so we have Frere, Brother Andre, Saint Andre, who was a miracle worker. Um, and that's part of our history and our culture and our tradition and the gifts that God gives us in the Catholic Church. So, it also empowers women. Believe it or not, women have a much greater role. You'll see them on television as evangelists, um, preaching. So they are entrusted with those roles. And as I pointed out as well, uh, they also see that uh, women are enhanced in their role of family and marriage because of the morality that Pentecostalism provides. There's a personal morality. Um, one can reform their life and uh, be accepted. There's also the presence of community, uh, that community and the role of community is very important in Pentecostalism. And then finally, he says, Pentecostalism has built within it competition. If you're not a good preacher, and people don't like what you're saying, they'll start another church. <laughs> um, it's true. And I, I saw this, this is another interesting aside, is working with uh, theological schools in North America for the last 10 or 15 years, I was amazed at always the number of theological schools of the Pentecostal tradition that were constantly being developed. And I don't want to say that, I think we've experienced that here in the Archdiocese in one of the new colleges that has come here as well. So there is, um, that's the reality. There's a competition and so it proliferates. So what's it all mean? Well, um, he comes up with the following probable consequences of Catholicism, for Catholicism. Uh, number one, the consequence of the rise of Pentecostalism will provide an increased emphasis on apologetics. That means that we will have to begin to explain and also to defend our faith and defend it in the face of a uh, inaccurate representation of Christianity and Catholicism. Not out of fear, but of actually setting the record straight and making sure that those within the Pentecostal movement truly understand the richness and the theology of Catholicism. So we're going to have to be re-articulating dogmas such as the Trinity, uh, Church, Ecclesiology, and um, so I see that. He sees that. And I also as well. There's also going to be much more of a horizontal ecumenism. And this comes to the grassroots. Because there's not a hierarchy, there won't be this official dialogue between the bishops and the adherents of Pentecostalism. Where there's going to be ecumenism and discussion of faith is going to be at parish and community level. That, to me, then, means that the formation of our laity in engaging in these type of conversations becomes very important and necessary as well. Because if we're going to have horizontal ecumenism, then we have to make sure that those within the church at all levels have a greater understanding of their faith. There's also a political ecumenism going to result from this, is that we and the Pentecostals are going to find synergy on issues of morality and social justice, some. Issues of homosexuality, uh, pro-life message, 
There's going to be a growing number of people in political offices in countries in the South who have Pentecostal as their uh, experience. And he says the following, there's going to be a tipping or a balancing point between the attrition to Pentecostalism and the strategic alliance with them on life issues. So we're going to have to balance that. Not looking at it as a negative that we're losing people to Pentecostalism, but that we are finding people who actually see the same message about the gospel of life. But do they understand it from the same theological perspective? Then I like this one. He calls this one the pastoral hustle. With competition, it will force us, the church, to re-examine our pastoral strategy. We're going to have to get up and start doing things. There's going to have to be a much more pastoral outreach and a thrust at parish and diocesan levels. So Catholicism could become better at it, and we might learn from the Pentecostals. And he says, we're going to have to do ministry to the nuns. Not religious nuns. Those who have no sociological religious affiliation. In the South, They've turned to uh, Pentecostalism, but here in the North, we should really be looking at those who have just stopped going to any religion. And that's the challenge here in North America. Finally, um, it's not that, that in the South. I'll conclude by saying the probable and possible consequences, and I'll just list them, a renewed emphasis on enculturation. There's going to be a comeback for exorcism and healings. There's going to be the empowering of Catholic women who will witness in the way that Pentecostals do. There's a probable comeback of the base ecclesial communities, which is going to actually force us to look at Catholicism in its communal dimension again, as the lay movements are trying to get us to do. Music ministry is going to be in some tension, but it will have renewed focus because of Pentecostalism and they are young. And we might have a fault line between liberal and conservative Catholics. And it might be heightened because Pentecostalism and evangelism uh, could begin to do that. It could actually create more internal dissent among ourselves, ideologically. That's possible. The long shot, and I hope that this doesn't happen, is that the parish might perish. That the fluidity of Pentecostalism and its democratization will put pressure on us as Catholics in our formal understanding of parish and hierarchy. And we might see the territorial parish coming under greater stress. So, in conclusion, I offer you just this brief summary, uh, some of my own comments. Uh, as I said, I've done it only to solicit uh, discussion and dialogue and debate. And if there's other insights that I haven't shared from, from the chapter or the book, uh, or you have other insights, then hopefully we can hear them in the discussion.